Thank you very much, uh, Laszlo, for your welcome this, this evening. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to thank you for the organisation you've done, along with Newbold Church and the, the pastor, to uh, facilitate tonight's program. Newbold, of course, has uh, been through its own challenges. And as we come tonight, we're not just looking at the, uh, the sort of challenges that we might have faced here. We're actually looking at challenges that are going to uh, impact the church and challenges that we will need to continue to wrestle with. If you've looked at the program, you'll see that there are a number of very significant um, topics that will be covered during the course of the uh, weekend, and we look forward to uh, the discussions that we'll have tomorrow afternoon. I've entitled my talk tonight, Seven Challenges Facing Adventists Today. And I want to start to think about those challenges, and the first one that I'm going to talk about is the one emerging heresy. We've always had an issue that has been around and about in terms of salvation. There is always the tension that we can have where we're actually talking about perfection or permissiveness or somewhere in between where we're actually responding to the salvation by grace that God has given us. We also have an emphasis with some of this on extrinsic religion. And when we talk about extrinsic religion, we're talking about the outward display of religious activities. And there are times when we're very good at dressing up and all looking great and coming to church with just the right size Bible in the right size shape with the right size clothing. But what difference has it really made to us internally? And then we can go on to the concept of uh, principles of understanding. Principles of understanding scripture. And there can be quite some discussion about that. And even more so, principles of understanding Ellen White. And these issues can continue to dog the church and become challenges that we need to address if we're going to have a healthy congregation. Of more recent times, we've seen a return to some of the concepts of even date setting. And you've seen people become quite interested and agitated about what might be happening in two or three or five years' time. We also have issues associated with the dominant culture. It's too easy for the church, no matter where you are, to actually start to follow more of the culture than look at taking biblical principles and applying them in a cultural context. It's as if sociology is determining theology rather than sociology informing how theology is applied in ministry. The second issue I'd like to talk about, the challenge of believers wandering. I think as we recover from COVID, it's fascinating to watch how different churches are responding, how different countries are responding. And for me, this is one of our challenges as we start to think about perhaps some of that reducing commitment. Maybe it's the level of involvement in churches, the willingness of people to volunteer and to be part of a, a ministry. Maybe it's also reflected perhaps in challenges of tithing. Although often in the crisis, tithing is likely to increase because we think if we're faithful to God, he'll be faithful to us. Interesting. But then you look at offerings. What's happening to offerings? Is this part of that reducing commitment? Is this part of the challenge of believers wandering? Another section of that is a concept of becoming spectators rather than players. Now, I'm sure you've been watching uh, the uh, Premiership League and you've been seeing all those spectators there and there's only been a few players. 
Is that an image for the church? I hope not. And there are times that I start to think that we're really becoming more like Seventh-day adventurers. In the virtual world, we become Sabbath surfers. In the physical world, we become church tourists. But we're at the stage where we are very much looking at the idea of spectators rather than players. Another area that we could look at as we talk about this emerging heresy is the concept of um, familiarity with belief. We'll get to this a little bit later. But I want to talk about, is there a difference between the first generation Adventist and the second or third, let alone the fifth or sixth that some of us might be? Is it easy for us to forget the benefits we experienced when we first believed and to start to take it for granted? The third topic I'd like to think about is the topic of unhealthy controversies. The challenge of focusing on the core when we're really starting to trend to focus on the periphery. Think about your church board meetings, your church business meetings. How often are we actually focusing on church budgets, focusing on maintenance? We always talk about the colour of the carpet or we always talk about something else like that. What about our involvement in the community? What about something important about people making decisions and becoming disciples and thinking through the issues of how we care and nurture rather than just fight over the periphery? Maybe there's also that difficult challenge of comfort and convenience versus mission and evangelism. We're commuters to our cultural comfort rather than engaging with a diverse community in and around us. We like to stay in our own bubble. It seems safe rather than the idea of actually engaging with those in the community on the terms of the community. We're very good at going out there when we want them to do something for us or when we wanted them to come and listen to us. But what about actually being involved in the community? Perhaps not just as the organisation of the church, but as individuals within the church. And of course there's the other concept coming through of power versus service. We're often very concerned about saving face rather than perhaps saving souls. The fourth challenge I would like to reflect on tonight is the challenge of distractions of this world. It's part of this concept of pursuit of wealth without work. Everybody wants to have money, everyone wants to have success, but does everyone really want to work? Is there an element here that we've actually lost the dignity of work? You stop and think about some of those paper transactions in the stock market, the takeovers, all of those sort of things. There's very clearly wealth being generated. But how much is that actually reflecting the ability of people working and people actually being able to make some sort of a living? What about the idea of success according to society? Is that one of the distractions we have? We're trying to live in the world, but perhaps becoming more of the world than just living in the world. Maybe we start to compromise our values and we start to think through what success would look like in the world as opposed to thinking about our real value in the eyes of Jesus. We can go on further and talk about the concept of imitating the world. 
And it's very easy to start to uncritically adopt the practices of the dominant culture. You know, it's fascinating when you work at a place like Newbold and you have students from across Europe, the Middle East, at times Africa. It's interesting to start to listen to some of their ways of doing church, the ways of leading, the ways of managing. And so often what we see is actually the concepts of the dominant culture being imposed on the church. Rather than thinking through what are the principles that we ought to be trying to apply in the context. And one of the other distractions that seems to be very prevalent is the idea of of chasing hedonistic entertainment. The concept of having pleasure at all costs. I will do everything I can during the week to be able to focus on the pursuit of pleasure in any of my spare time. Distractions of the world. The fifth challenge I would suggest we're facing is a concept that we are no longer contagious. Now, you all understand contagiousness. We're still coming out of COVID. We've all worked out how you get COVID. We've tried to work out how you don't get COVID. And now we've got monkeypox. And we're trying to stay away from that as well. I'm sure you understand the concept of being contagious. I learned it as a very young child. In my only term of kindergarten, I contracted chickenpox and measles. And of course, being the youngest of three at the time, my younger brother wasn't yet born, I figured it was my civic duty to make sure that my elder sisters contracted them as well. I was such a loving brother. And my love just flowed out of me, including chickenpox and measles. But think about it in the spiritual context. Why aren't we contagious? You've seen people who've just come to know Jesus. And there's something about that enthusiasm, that vibrance. It doesn't matter what happens, nothing seems to temper it. And by the way, There's nothing more exciting in life than actually seeing someone accept Jesus for the first time. And that's one of the privileges of ministry. And I wonder really whether it's a matter that we've just lost our first love. We've just sort of settled down into the routine, into the groove. Maybe it's because there is a lack of assurance of salvation. Maybe we're just not quite sure where we are. It's a very timid Christian life. Maybe we're overwhelmed by some of the social media posts. Maybe we're overwhelmed by some of the minority voices that try to tell us that if you believe, especially in a God, and if you practice that, well, maybe there's something missing. Maybe it's also a sense of inferiority. Many of us have lived in cultures where there is a state church and we're just one of those unknown American sex. You know, from that country that used to be a colony but got their independence. It seems as if we have somehow lost that fire and it's now this very timid Christian life and even if we were asked whether we're a believer or not we'd probably be like Peter and sort of slink away and try and avoid the question change the topic do something else the timid Christian life I reflect back a decade or so ago when there were great celebrations about 150th anniversary of uh, Charles Darwin and what Darwin had published and how the buses were plastered with billboards that sort of said, there probably isn't a God. Go and enjoy life. 
And yet in the middle of that media coverage of so much, you still had some voices who were prepared to come out and say, I'm a believer. And it was in that context that I first heard John Lennox, Professor John Lennox, talk about the real basis of some faith. Some of the philosophical understandings that undergird what we believe as Christians. But it seems as if it's so easy for us to be timid and try and hide some of those things in the face of the social pressures. Then, of course, we can talk about difficult times. Our sixth challenge that we want to refer to tonight. People are pretty selfish, focusing just on me and what I want. They're often boasters trying to talk about making things great again. They're often doing their own thing. The idea of, if you like, being disobedient and ignoring any sense of law and order. We just want to get our point across. We'll disrupt anything, no matter whether it's legal or illegal, because this is something that we want to say and this is something we want to do. Maybe there's a concept that we've got so used to taking things for granted that we can be ungrateful and also unholy. Maybe there's this concept of malicious gossip. The idea that we've always got to be able to find the the dirt on somebody and put it out there and use social media to say whatever we want and hope that no one's going to try and take us to court for libel or defamation. Maybe there's an element of brutality of treachery. Maybe there's just a form of godliness where we deny the power of who God is and what God has promised to do. Those are difficult times. And we can think about other difficult times. War and peace. The economy. Survival. But I want to keep coming back to the fact these are challenges that face the church, the members of the church, and what they do and how they present in the community. The last one I want to reflect on is a concept of persecution. Now, For many of us in this society, it might just be mocking. It might just be ridicule. It might just be someone saying, you don't believe that, do you? Come on, you can't accept that. And yet there are plenty of people for whom persecution is much more than that mocking or that ridicule. I was reading just recently a 2019 report commissioned by the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. And it was making it very clear that Christians around the world are the most persecuted religious group. If you want to turn it in terms of countries, it's about 144 countries around the world where there'll be persecution for the, uh, for the um, Christians and believers. Now, sure, there are other people who are equally involved. Muslims are also persecuted. But it's fascinating to stop and think about the fact that Christians are the most persecuted group, religious group, in the world. And Jeremy Hunt goes on to say, political correctness had played a part in the issue not being confronted. A government report. Interesting. And when you talk about some of that uh, sort of persecution, the other persecution to what we might experience, generally speaking, here and now, it's attacks on churches. 
It's imprisonment of pastors, abduction of girls, forced conversions, and at times concentration camps. And what is most troubling for me, as I stop and think about this issue of persecution, some of the countries that are actually leading the persecution are former Commonwealth countries. Interesting, isn't it? The government has fallen asleep over the persecution of Christians. And yet religious liberty is one of those key issues that we see surface every so often in the media about someone has been dismissed because of their faith. What we can and can't do in the public square because of our faith. Now, you might be uh, wondering why I've chosen these particular seven challenges to talk about tonight. Let me suggest to you that these are the challenges that we will find in First and Second Timothy. They're the challenges that we find back in the church of Ephesus to which Paul wrote to the young pastor, Timothy. I want you to think about that, that when Paul wrote those letters to Timothy, that young pastor of the church of Ephesus, that church was only somewhere between about eight and ten years old. And yet, those issues were all starting to emerge within that context. And it seems to me that those issues have never gone away. It seems to me that those issues are just as fresh and relevant today as they were back in the first century when Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus and its young pastor, Timothy. But it interests me that when we stop and think about those challenges, Paul in that letter to that young pastor doesn't just leave it with the challenges. He also comes with some concepts of what to do about it. And I want to go and look at those seven strategies that Paul suggests ought to be used and I would suggest are there to combat these seven challenges. The first one we find in what Paul writes, one of the most important ones, is the concept of preaching the word, correcting, rebuking, encouraging with patience and instruction. Wow. Preach the word. The power of anything is in the word of God. It's not in the fancy preacher. It's not in the fancy illustrations, although they help people remember. But the power is in the word of God. And the first thing Paul suggests that we should focus on is preaching the word. Not so much what I think about the word, not so much about other ideas that I think are good ideas and might sprinkle them with a text to baptise them and make them holy. It's the word. The power of the word. And I trust over this weekend, this will be something that you will experience as we actually start to look at what the word has to say to many of the challenges that we face today. The second strategy that Paul talks about is fighting the good fight of the faith. It's interesting he's using that sort of language. But what I want you to focus on is the idea of being able to have a clear picture of what you believe and making sure you hang on to it. Another phrase he uses there is guard what has been entrusted to you. For me, that's a very, very powerful sentence. 
What God has given to us has been entrusted to us. Trust is a very powerful word. And the salvation and the knowledge of salvation has been entrusted to us. Guard it. Protect it. Preserve it. Keep it. The third one I want to focus on is Paul's comment about pursuing righteousness. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Good values. Things that will endure. Things that will stay with us. And I love what he also puts into that same sort of phrase and context. Turn away from godless chatter. I think the translators have done well with that sort of little picture. Godless chatter. You know? Noise without substance. Noise without purpose. Noise without meaning. That's the opposite of the concept of pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. The fourth strategy Paul talks about is the idea of doing good. Command those who are rich to put their hope in God, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. We understand the Christian value of sharing. We understand the concept of volunteering. I was interested when I was uh, serving on the Board of Governors at St Crispin's Comprehensive School in Wokingham. Just how many Christians were actually serving on that governing body? Practising Christians. Wasn't everybody. And it wasn't as if we were out there reading scripture and talking about this all the time, but you notice that underneath it, there was this value that Christians volunteer. They share. They give. And although it's not an exclusive right, an opportunity of Christians, it's fascinating to notice this statement. Command those who are rich to put their hope in God, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and to be willing to share. The fifth strategy that Paul uses and talks about is the idea of taking hold of eternal life. I remember seeing some posters of someone on the edge of a cliff trying to climb up this cliff. Let me assure you, it wasn't a picture of me. That's not something I like to do. And they're holding on for grim death to every crevice every crack, anything they can to be able to keep climbing that cliff. Their life depends on it. I don't understand those who choose to, you know, get a tent and suspend it and hang off the side of a cliff and sleep in it. But I want you to capture that image of of holding on, taking hold of something that's going to give you life. And not just life here and now, but life to come. Remember, there is nothing anyone can say and do to you that will ever change what God thinks of you. And of course, you've got that famous Jim Elliot quote. That young missionary who was martyred in South America, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Take hold of eternal life. The sixth strategy Paul talks about is the idea of doing the evangelist's work. To the young Timothy, he's saying, discharge all the duties of your ministry and keep your head in all situations. 
good advice, not just for the young pastor, but for all of us. And the seventh strategy that that Paul goes to talk about is the idea of actually enduring hardship. And it reminds me very much of that quote in Hebrews where it says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Stop and think about it. Just think about the challenge that was to have very God come to live amongst us. To show us the Father. To show us the example. To be persecuted so that you and I might have life. Because his death has taken my place. Endure hardship. As we put this together tonight, I want you just to see the seven strategies that we've talked about. Preach the word. Correct, rebuke and encourage with patience and instruction. Fight the good fight of the faith. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Do good, be rich in good deeds, generous, ready to share. Take hold of the eternal life. Work as evangelists and endure persecution. And as we conclude tonight, I want you just to to actually look at this summary. Look at the challenges that Paul illustrates. Look at the strategies that he actually uses to address them. Where there is emerging heresy, preach the word. Where the believers are wandering, have them try and fight that fight of faith. Guard what has been entrusted to them. Where there is unhealthy controversy, let's refocus And pursue godliness, righteousness, faith and love. Where there are distractions of the world, be good, sorry, be rich in good deeds and share. Where there is a timid Christian life and we seem to have lost our voice in society, our place in the public square. Take hold of eternal life. And when there are difficult times, that's when we really need to focus on being those evangelists with the good news, carrying out those roles of ministry. And when it is persecution, Paul's advice is don't run away from it, even though there were a couple of times he escaped a city or two. He's saying, endure that. Because here, you will understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So tonight, as we open this conference, I want you to think about the big picture that is being painted when Paul writes to the young pastor of that church in Ephesus. Those challenges are emerging within eight to ten years of that church being planted. And yet with those challenges, there comes the strategies to try and ensure that we can still live and honour God no matter what may be happening in the context in which we live and work.